back road into Boonesboro. It was good country for slow driving, particularly in the late spring. There was nobody else on the road. The woods were just blooming into a deep, rich green as unburned by summer, and the afternoons were still cool and fresh. And just before he reached the Boonesboro town line, he saw the locked and weathered cottage standing for sale on its quarter acre lot. He had pulled his road car up to a gentle stop, swung sideways in his seat and looked at it. It needed paint. The siding had gone from white to gray and the trim was faded. There were shingles missing here and there from the roof, leaving squares of darkness on the sun bleached rows of cedar and inevitably some of the window panes had cracked but the frame hadn't slouched out of square and the roof hadn't sagged. The chimney stood up straight. He looked at the straggled clumps and wood-road hay that were all that remained of the shrubbery and the lawn. His hands itched for the feel of a spade. He got out of the road car, walked across the road and up to the cottage door and copied down the name of the real estate dealer listed on the card, tacked to the door frame. Now it was almost two years later, early in April, and Gus was top dressing his lawn. Earlier in the day, he'd set up a screen beside the pile of topsoil behind the house, shoveled the soil through the screen, mixed it with broken peat moss, and carted it out to the lawn, where he left it in small piles. Now he was carefully raking it out over the young grass in a thin layer that covered only the roots and let the blades peep through. He intended to be finished by the time the second half of the giant Kodiak's double header came on. And he had something of an avulcular interest in housing. He worked without waste motion or excess expenditure of energy. Once or twice he stopped and had a beer in the shade of the Rosa bar he'd put up around the front door. Nevertheless, the sun was hot. By early afternoon, he had his shirt off. Just before he would have been finished, a battered fliver settled down in front of the house. It parked with a flurry of its rotors and a gangling man in a worn serge suit with thin hair plastered across his tight scalp climbed out and looked at Gus uncertainly. Gus had glanced up briefly while the fliver was on its silent way down. He'd made out the barely legible Falmouth County Clerk's office lettered over the faded paint on its doors. Shrugged and gone on with what he was doing. Gus was a big man. His shoulders were heavy and broad. His chest was deep, grizzled with thick iron grey hair. His stomach had gotten a little heavier over the years, but the muscles were still there under the layer of flesh. His upper arms were thicker than a good many thighs, and his forearms were enormous. His face was seamed by a network of folds and creases. His flat cheeks were marked out by two deep furrows that ran from the sides of his bent nose, merged with the creases bracketing his wide lips, and converged towards the blunt point of his jaw. His pale blue eyes twinkled above his high cheekbones which were covered with wrinkles. His close-cropped hair was as white as cotton. Only repeated, an annoying exposure would give his body a tan. But his face was permanently browned. In several places, the pink of his body sunburn was broken by white scar tissue. The thin line of a knife emerged from the tops of his pants and faded out across the right side of his stomach. The other significant area of scarring lay across the uneven knuckles of his heavy fingered hands. The clerk looked at the mailbox to make sure of the name, checking it against an envelope he was holding in one hand. He stopped and looked at Gus again, mysteriously nervous. 
guests abruptly realized that he probably didn't present a reassuring appearance with all the screening and raking he'd been doing. There'd been a lot of dust in the air mixed with perspiration. It was all over his face, chest, arms and back. Gus knew he didn't look very gentle, even at cleanest and best dressed. At the moment, he couldn't blame the clerk for being skittish. He tried to smile disarmingly. The clerk ran his tongue over his lips, cleared his throat <coughs> with a slight cough and jerked his head towards the mail block. Is that right? You Mr. Kusevik? Gus nodded. That's right. What can I do for you? The clerk held up the envelope. Got a notice here from the county council, he muttered. But he was obviously much more taken up by his effort to equate Gus with the rosa boar, the neatly edged and carefully tended flower beds, the hedges, the flagstone walk, the small goldfish pond under the willow tree, the white painted cottage with its window boxes and bright shutters, and the curtains showing inside the sparkling windows. Gus waited until the man was through with his obvious thoughts, but something deep inside him sighed quietly. He had gone through this moment of bewilderment with so many other people that he was quite accustomed to it. But that is not the same thing as being oblivious. Well, come on inside, he said after a decent interval. It's pretty hot out here, and I've got some beer in the cooler. The clerk hesitated again. Well, all i got to do is dis deliver this notice, he said, still looking around. Got the place real fixed up nice, haven't you? Gus smiled. It's my home. A man likes to live in a nice place. In a hurry? The clerk seemed to be troubled by something in what Gus had said. Then he looked up suddenly, obviously just realizing he'd been asked a direct question. Huh? You're not in any hurry, are you? Come on in, have a beer. Nobody's expected to be a ball of fire on a spring afternoon, are they? The clerk grinned uneasily. No, no, guess not. He brightened. Okay. Don't mind if I do. <laughs> Gush, Gus ushered him into the house, grinning with pleasure. Nobody'd seen the inside of the place since he'd fixed it up. The clerk was the first visitor he'd had since moving in. There weren't even any delivery men. Boonesboro was so small you had to drive in for your own shopping. There wasn't any mail carrier service, of course. Not that Gus ever received any mail. He showed the clerk into the living room. Have a seat. I'll be right back. He went quickly out to the kitchen took some beer out of the cooler, loaded a tray with glasses, a bowl of chips and pretzels and the beer and carried it out. The clerk was up, looking around the library that covered two of the living room walls. Looking at his expression, Gus realized with genuine regret that the man wasn't the kind to doubt whether an obvious clod like Kusevik had read any of the stuff. A man like that could still be talked to. Once the original misconceptions were knocked down, nah, the clerk was too painfully mystified that a grown man would fool with books, particularly a man like Gus. Now, one of these kids that messed with college politics, that was something else, but a grown man oughtn't to act like that. Gus saw it had been a bit of a mistake to expect anything of the clerk. 
he should have known better whether he was hungry for company or not. He'd always been hungry for company. And it was time he realized once and for all that he just plain wasn't going to find any. He set the tray down on the table, uncapped a beer quickly and handed it to the man. Thanks, the clerk mumbled. He took a swallow, sighed loudly, and wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. He looked around the room again. Cost, cost a lot to put all this stuff in, huh? Gus shrugged. Did most of it myself. Built the shelves and furniture, stuff like that. Some of the paintings I had to buy. And the books and records and so forth. The clerk grunted. <laughs> he seemed to be considerably ill at ease. Probably because of the notice he'd brought. Whatever it was, Gus found himself wondering what it could possibly be. But now that he'd made the mistake of giving the man a beer, he had to wait politely until it was finished before he could ask. He went over to the TV set. Baseball fan? He asked the clerk. Sure. Giants, Kodiaks ought to be on.